When we last left, we had just finished saying that we had change in networking capital, and we said that that was one of the three things that we're looking for. So that leaves us two things left that we need to figure out. And both of these things depend on depreciation uh, because we can, let's see, we've got, to, we've got to mess with depreciation here. Now, it's going to come out in the wash, but it does impact our taxes. It's also going to impact the book value of that machine at the end. And we know that's going to impact our net capital spending because it shows up right here. So what I'd like to do is look at the net capital spending next. And we're going to look at what kinds of things do we have to look at. We have a building and we have the bowling ball machine. Can you think of any other assets that we're going to have to invest in here other than current assets? I think that's it. So let's talk about that. Um, let's start with the building. building. When should we record that opportunity cost for the building? Yeah, time zero, right? That's when we could sell it and, and we'll just walk away from this thing. So, and keep in mind this is net capital spending, so money going out is positive. So I'm just going to click on the building here. Now, the next question is this. Do we have depreciation on opportunity costs? No. Do, so if there were depreciation on this building, it would have already been occurring. And so any, uh, the, the depreciation would not be incremental to the project. And so we're just going to leave that zero all the way through here. And then at the very end, what happens? What was the assumption? Yeah, we get everything back at the end. So all I've got to do is say equal negative, And I'm going to click over here. So that takes care of the building. And then we've got the bowling ball machine. And the bowling ball machine starts out at $100,000. So I'm going to say equal to and click on that $100,000. Now keep in mind that we're talking about net capital spending. So money out is positive, money in is negative. Now, are there any cash flows that happen uh, capital spending wise with that bowling ball machine over its life? I so. A little bit. Stuff. Uh, no, that's actually that's not considered capital spending. Oh, it is not. Yeah, yeah maintenance would just go under, and we'll we'll talk about fixed costs. Uh, so then nothing. Yet. Okay, so it's being depreciated, but is that a cash expense? No. No. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and figure out what is the book value of the bowling ball machine. Well, we'll figure out depreciation. We'll figure out the book value of the bowling ball machine, and then finally that will allow us to figure out the after-tax salvage value. And so I'm kind of, I guess, getting a little bit out of order here, but let's talk about depreciation. And I want you to look at table, um, table 8.3 is all about depreciation. It is the uh, MACRS, Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System. It's on page 236. And they have different classes of things. These are called recovery periods. And they've got names like three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, 20 years, and so on. Can anybody tell me how many numbers or years show up under three years? Four. Can anyone tell me? How many numbers show up under five years? Six. 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 <laughs> Swinging them. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So you don't actually have to count now that we know how this game is played, do you? How many do you think there are for 20 years? 20. 21, right? And this is because some days you should just stay home, right? Okay. <laughs> Today's not that day. Back to the story. So um, why is it that way? Because the way the U.S. government comes up with this stuff was through the double declining balance with half-year convention. 
Now, do you need to know any of that? Absolutely not. What you need to know is that there's one more of these little decimals than there are years named above. And the second thing that you need to know is that that first number is going to be smaller than the second one. That's because of the half year convention. Now, why do they do that? Who knows? I've tried forever to understand the government and it still doesn't work for me. So there you go. Okay, now, what are we going to do with these numbers? Let's ask this question. This is easiest for the numbers under three years. What do they add up to? If you can't do it in your head, you've probably got your calculator. I told you you needed to have it out and ready. Probably one. Yeah, they add up to one. Now, what does that mean? Here's what these decimals are going to do. Every year, we're going to multiply the historical cost by the decimal, and that's going to give us this year's depreciation. And so by the time I subtract out all of the depreciation, I am going to be at a book value of zero. By the time I get through the entire depreciation, I will be at a book value of zero. Now, our problem tells us that we've got a five-year um, project, and we're going to use five years mackers, but what does that mean? We're going to have six years worth of depreciation there. We are not going to be able to depreciate this thing fully down to zero. We could if it were a six-year project, but because it's a five-year project, we cannot. Okay. By the way, am I going to make you remember this crap for an exam? No. Am I going to make you put it on your note sheet? No. When I give you a problem on the exam, I'm going to say that we're going to straight line depreciate it to zero. If I tell you we're going to straight line a $100,000 asset to zero over five years, how much is the depreciation every year? 20000 bucks, right? So that'll make your life a whole lot easier. Okay. So let's go ahead and we're going to put in the modified accelerated cost recovery system. By the way, this was actually kind of done away with by the 2017 tax patriot loophole act or whatever it was called. <laughs> and, but here's the trick. What's about to happen to that thing? It's about to expire. And um, I don't see everybody gathering together, singing Kumbaya and re-anointing it, right? And so what it's going to do is it's going to flip back to exactly what we had before. I had a student said, well, why didn't you go ahead and do it with the new stuff? And I'm like, because I knew it would go back, and I'm too lazy to redo all my material. So that's why that update's out there for taxes, right? Okay, so let's talk about Mackers. By the way, notice uh, it doesn't, does it say year zero or year one to start on this table 8.3? Yeah, it starts at year one. And so we're going to move over here, and it's going to be 0 0.2, 0 0.32, um, 0 0.192, and then 0 0.1152, 0 0.1152. How are two years identical? I have no idea. And then the last one, which we're not going to get, is 0 0.0576. So how do I get the depreciation? Well, we just said it is the decimal times the historical cost. So what I'm going to do here is say equal to the decimal times the historical cost right there. Now what do I need to do right now to be able to copy this over? I've got to put in the dollar sign. I'm going to use F4. On the Mac we hear it is control T. So then I'm going to copy that over and you can see that each one of those is 100,000 times the decimal. Now notice that this happens after. So there's $5,760 left that we haven't depreciated by the end of the project. What does that mean the book value of this thing is going to be at the end? $5,760. Because if we've been able to do it completely, we would be at zero. Okay, now that I have a depreciation, I can do bowling ball machine. Ah, book value. And it's going to start out as the historical cost. Because <coughs> after all, book value is historical cost minus accumulated depreciation. How much depreciation do we have at this point? No. Okay, then what I'm going to do for book value beyond that is I'm going to say, I'm going to look at the last book value, or the last book value, and I'm going to subtract the current year's depreciation. So it's going to be equal to the prior year's book value minus 
the current year's depreciation. Now I'm going to roll that over here, and then we can see at the end that the book value of the machine, as predicted, is five thousand seven hundred and sixty bucks. Okay, now uh, we have enough information to do the after-tax salvage value for the bowling ball machine. And by the way, the after-tax salvage value always happens in the last period of the project because that's when we shut things down and sell the machine. And we said that the after-tax salvage value was equal to the market value. That's what I can sell the machine for today. Minus our marginal or incremental tax rate times mar uh, market value minus book value. If we have underdepreciated this thing, in other words, the market value or the book value is greater than the market value, we'll get a tax rebate. Or look, is the book value greater than the market value? Then we get a tax rebate. If the market value is greater than the book value, then we have to pay taxes because we have underpaid our taxes because we overdepreciated the asset. If we underdepreciate the asset, what does that mean we've done with our taxes? We've overpaid, and so we get money back. Okay, so here we go. First thing we got to remember, though, is that because this is spending, if it's money coming in, what's the sign on that? Negative. Yeah, it's got to be negative. And so I'm going to start off by saying equal, negative, open parenthesis. And now I'm looking for this market value. So I'm going to roll up here. And that is your bowling ball machine value in year five. And then I'm going to say minus, and then we're going to do the tax rate times, open parentheses, the market value minus the book value. Oh, book. Yeah, book value right there. And then I'm going to say close parentheses, close parentheses. Why did I have to put two parentheses at the end? Yeah, if I've got two of these, I have to have two of these. If I've got seven of these, I have to have seven of these. The uh, most common frustrating mistake students make when they're doing this is that they don't get those equal to each other, the equal amount of the opposite parentheses. Now, we see that we've got a neg negative 21,760 bucks coming in at the end, which if we look at, uh, where do they do that? It, it's, uh, it's correct. Okay, so now we've got depreciation. What else do we need depreciation for? We need it to be able to figure out OCF because we need to figure out our taxes. But there's one more thing we can do here. I think we actually now have enough information to calculate our net capital spending. So here we go. Net capital spending equal to this plus this. I'm going to drag that all the way across. Boom. There we go. Okay, so because that's one of the three things we're looking for, I'm going to go ahead and bold it. By the way, what's the shortcut for saving your work? Control S, right? Okay. Now we've got uh, everything except for OCF. So let's go back up here, and I'm going to do something that's actually not in the project. We've got variable costs in here. What other kind of costs do we tend to talk about? Yeah, fixed costs. So I'm going to put in a line here. And the reason I'm doing this is if later you decide to, I'm hoping that you all will put this on a thumb drive and wear it on a necklace. And that way, if you ever need to do one of these, you could just whip it out and take a look, right? I want you to remember that there is more than just uh, variable costs. There's also fixed costs to be considered. Now, fixed costs. Uh, fixed costs actually don't have to be the same every year. For instance, uh, the university just gave everyone here a 4% raise. What do you think happened to our fixed costs? It jumps up, right? But what fixed costs means is it doesn't change based on the number of units of production. By the way, what do you think our units of production are here at the university? You're looking at them, right? 
And so our fixed costs, when only half of you show up and pay tuition, they don't change. So that's what we're talking about here, fixed costs. So I'm gonna say fixed costs, and I'm just gonna put in zero because in this example, there aren't any. And I'm gonna start by saying equal to, boom. And I'm gonna hit the F4 and then just copy it over. Why are there no fixed costs at time zero? In finance, cash flow happens at the end of the period. So that means any cash flow we were looking at at time zero happened between negative one and time zero. How much fixed cost did we have then? Oops, right? Okay. Then I can come up with my total, <coughs> let's call it total op operational costs. And I'm just going to say equal to variable costs plus fixed costs. I'm just going to drag that straight over. And I'm going to save. Okay. Insert. Oh, no, no, no. By the way, what's undo on Windows? Control Z. Most important thing you'll ever do. Unfortunately, when you make bad stock trades, there is no Control Z. Okay, now we've got all this information that we can put into our, uh, basically we're doing like an income statement here. So at the top you've got sales and you can subtract out your cost of goods sold, you're selling general and administrative expenses. Uh, we also subtract out our interest on an income statement, but are we gonna do anything with interest here? No, why not? It's a cost of financing and how are we accounting for our cost of financing? Through the this minutes? Discount. The discount rate. I knew she knew. I could see the knowledge on her face. Okay, so um, the discount rate. We said that is how we're accounting for the cost of financing. And so we don't need to worry about that. But we do need to worry about depreciation. Is depreciation a real cash flow? No. Why do we care about depreciation at all? Because it impacts our taxes. That is the only reason on earth that finance people care about depreciation is because of taxes. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go down here, since we've already calculated this thing, and I'm going to say Control C. I'm going to bring it up here, and I'm going to say Control, oh, I'm going to say, I'm going to paste the values, because I don't want to paste the formulas, right? Because it, it would be goofy if I did that. Okay. Whew. Now, we can actually finally figure our pre-tax income. Like spelling can we be in good shape? Okay. What do you think I should start with? Yeah, sales equal sales minus total operating costs minus depreciation. And then I'm going to copy that over. So that's our pre-tax income. Let's see if we can get a validation from the table. Income before taxes. Yes, those numbers are correct. So I'm looking at table 8.1. Those numbers are correct. Now that we know our pre-tax income, what can we calculate? Mr. Russell Walkwood. We know our pre-tax income. We know our tax rate. What can we calculate? He's, he's just looking at me very deeply, like he's deep in thought, but I think perhaps he does not know. So I'm going to ask Mr. Taylor. What was that? If I've got three taxes? Yeah, we can figure our taxes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say it's equal to the pre-tax income times, I'm going to roll up here and grab this tax rate. What button should I hit right now? F4. F4. I'm going to put in them dollar signs. There we go. I'm going to drag that over. And those are our taxes. Now let's see what we have. We're looking for OCF. And we said that OCF is earnings before interest and taxes. Now that is exactly the same as this pre-tax income because there's no 
This thing's just like a student. It just like drifts off. Okay, so we've got earnings per interest and taxes. We're not dealing with interest. So this pre-tax income that we've got is exactly the same thing as this. We're going to add back depreciation and subtract taxes. Do we have all three of these things? Yeah. And so I can go ahead and say O, C, F, and just say equal to the pre-tax income plus depreciation minus taxes. I'm going to drag that all the way over. There we go. OK. Any questions so far? In the, in the example, they give net income on line 13 of table 8.1. Can anybody tell me how to get from net income to the numbers we're showing here? Uh, so net income, they're, they're actually giving it to us. Yeah, if we had just um, gone ahead and subtracted taxes from pre-tax income, that would have given us net income. And in a world where there is no interest, you can also get OCF. is equal to the net income add back depreciation. Because we're not dealing with interest, we don't have to worry about that. And so that would be another way that you could get this exact same number. Any questions? Okay. So now we have all the things that we were hoping to have to add together to get cash flow from assets. And so we're going to come up with a different, I'm going to go ahead and do another set of years down here. And we're going to call this cash flow from assets. And cash flow from assets, remember that's the cash flow that we're actually going to be throwing into our net present value machine to figure out whether this is a good project or not. And so what I want to do is say this is equal to um, OCF, OC, ah, nope, OCF minus NCS minus the change in net working capital. And so it puts me at negative 260000 up front. And I can go ahead and drag that over. And that gives me cash flow from assets for everything up here. And if you wanted to check the work on that one, let's see here. You could look at line six of table 8.4. They're calling it the total cash flow of the project. By the way, do you know why we give things multiple names in finance? Just to confuse students. That's what students usually think. The truth is that uh, people have developed these, uh, oh, come on. People have developed these ideas in different areas. And so when, when I invent something on my own, I come up with a name for it. Uh, do you think it's ever possible for two people to invent the same thing at the same time? I'll give you an example. Um, calculus. What was that? Telephone, yeah, that's a good example. I'll, I'll give you one where I can actually name the two guys. I can only name one of the telephone guys. Um, the uh, calculus was invented by Sir Isaac Newton. It was probably what you were taught. Um, on the other side of the planet, uh, Ms. Volkova was probably taught that a man named Leibniz from Germany invented calculus. Does that sound right? Yeah, they did it at the same time. And they spent the rest of their lives bitching at each other and saying, I came up with it first. No, <laughs> it happened at the same time. Oh my goodness, we're way off into the sticks, but hey, there's your liberal arts education for the day. Okay, so that's cash flow from assets. This is what I'm going to throw into my NPV formula, but there's something that I'm missing, and that is the discount rate. Usually, we're either given the discount rate or we're given enough to calculate what the discount rate should be. However, we haven't been told squat. And if you look at table 8.4, you can see what they do is walk through a bunch of different discount rates to demonstrate what they do to NPV. So we're going to set up our little situation here, and I'm just going to create a cell for the rate. 
And then uh, we will have um, n, p, v. And so I'm going to start out with the rate that they give us of 4%, so 0.04. And then I'm going to go ahead and format that as a percentage. And now I'm going to show you how to use the formula for NPV in Excel. And you might think, oh, well, it's going to be easy, and it's probably self-explanatory. It should be, but here's the problem. The formula was created not by finance people like me. It was created by computer geeks, Com completed by computer geeks. And so uh, it's been wrong forever and a day. And so what I'm going to teach you is how to address the wrongs in that formula. So what we're going to do here is we're going to type equal n p v open parentheses. Looks pretty good so far. Now the cool thing is Excel, and it didn't used to do this, but now it's like, hey, hey buddy, I'm looking for a rate here. Do you see that? It's, it's bolded. So I'm going to click on the cell for the rate, and then I'm going to hit a comma. And as soon as I hit that comma, it says value 1. Notice it says value 1. Does it say value 0? No. And so what happens is I'm going to start here, and then I can just hold, go ahead and drag that whole thing in there. C colon 42, C, colon, C 42 colon G 42 is exactly the same as saying C 42 comma D 42 comma E 42 comma F 42 comma G 42, but it's a whole lot quicker, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to close that. Now, here's what NPV formula really means in Excel. It is the present value at time zero of cash flows beginning at time one. That's the second part of the definition, or uh, maybe this, it's, it's one of the two parts of the definition of NPV, uh, the present value of the subsequent cash flows, right? But it doesn't account for the initial investment. And so that is why we have to go back and make a correction here. I'm going to say plus and then hit that. Now, why did I hit plus? Because it's already negative, right? It's already negative. And so I'm going to hit enter. And it's saying $123,643.13. How far off is our number from that of the book? A couple of bucks, right? A couple of bucks. Now, why is ours off a couple of bucks? The answer comes down to rounding. Remember earlier when we were doing price per unit and cost per unit, I said the book rounds this stuff to the nearest penny, but we're not going to do that. That's the reason. If you're really excited and thrilled about doing such things after I post this on Blackboard, you can feel free to go back and, and play with the uh, rounding functions in Excel and see if you can get exactly the same number. <coughs> I, I tell you, I've done this for years and I've never had anybody take me up in that offer. Okay, now uh, we've got 4%. So if the discount rate is 4%, would we accept this project? Yeah, why? It's positive. In fact, if I ask you how much wealth is created by this project, for the Baldwin Company, you would tell me, Mr. Bell right there. 123643 yeah. $123,643.13. That's it. Okay, now, um, if we raise the discount rate, that's going to lower the present value of those future cash flows. And so it's going to bring our NPV down. So let's use their next uh, number here, 10%. And it brings us down to 51590 which once again is $2 off. And if we use 15%, we're down to $5,473.93, which is like $2 off. Now, let's ask this question here. If you are doing a project and you get this kind of NPV, what is the <coughs> theoretical answer to the question, do we accept the project? Yeah, we accept it, right? Okay, now, if you're doing this in the real world, what should you consider also? How much money am I having to invest to get this NPV? By the way, is this NPV a certain number? Is, are we, do we know we're going to get that? No, it's a scientific wild ass guess, right? It's our best. It's like the weather forecast. In fact, probably less accurate, though. And so what we're telling you, what I'm telling you here is I would then look back and say, well, wait a minute, 
260,000, do I really want to gamble 260,000 plus my precious time and efforts in order to get this project up off the ground just to increase shareholder wealth by $5,473.93? My answer would be no. And it's from experience. Um, what about if the machine, we get the bowling ball machine in and we realize that the concrete's not thick enough in the floor and we have to spend $5,500 to fix the problem. What just happened? Yeah, we're negative. And so be careful when you do such things. If this were 10%, yeah, I'm up for that and definitely up for it at 4%. Um, then the, they say 15.67%. This thing should be zero. And there are, t oh, I'm going to go ahead and bump this out so you can see it. Uh, that's not the one I was working on, this one. There we go. They say it should be zero. What is the discount rate that makes NPV zero? We have a name for it. IRR. And there's two reasons that this 15.67 doesn't truly bring us to uh, zero MPV. Uh, the first is because of that rounding thing we talked about. And the second is uh, because of, but that was for the dollars and cents rounding. But it's also the rounding here. If I, uh, when I figure IRR, you're going to see that it's much more complex than that. So, how do we do IRR? I'm going to say, and this one's really easy by the way, equal IRR open parentheses, and it tells me values. And I just go, and then, there I go. Now, it says 16%, but we know that's not the case. You see how many decimal places are there? The book's only reporting 15.67. Maybe they had 15.66, and some other crap, right? Okay, now, what if I were to plug this IRR into where it says rate. What should happen? Yeah, it should the MPV should be zero. Oh, I got a the control Z. I'm going to paste just the number. There we go. Now we've got our zero MPV. Now, uh, you've done all this work and it all looks really good, but you should always check your work with the calculator. I'm going to go back to 4% here. So, get your calculator out. And I'm going to say CF, second. Clear work. What do you think I'm going to put in for CF zero? Yeah, negative 260,000. So, 260,000. One, two, three. Negative, enter, 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 okay, arrow down, C01, Mr. Osawagwo, what should I put in for C01? Zero. Swing it oh, around. I'm sorry, three, nine. It's yeah. Seven. Sorry. And he has redeemed himself. <laughs> uh, Ms. Ware, what should I do for F01? Uh, 54,192. Oh, that is just one. Yep. Sorry, it's going That's okay. Common mistake. It's the reason I ask. Uh, Ms. Wabi, what should I do for C02? 54192. 54192. Enter. Arrow down. Um, Mr. Green, what should I do for F02? Yeah, leave it at one. In fact, are any of these things going to be ever F something more than one? No, it's different in every period, right? Holy crap. Okay. Now let's see. C zero three six six eight four six. Enter. Arrow down. F zero three stays one. Uh, C zero four fifty nine eight ninety six. Enter. Arrow down. Arrow down. And C zero five two two four six. Five, oh. Enter. Okay. Now, what do you think we do in order to find <coughs> NPV, Ms. Morena? NPV. Oh, very good. NPV. 
Now, what should I put in for i in order to replicate this number we've got down here? Four. Yeah, I'm going to put in four. Okay, enter, and then what's the next step, Mr. Holman? Hit the down arrow. Yeah, the down arrow, and then what button should I hit next, Mr. Fisher? Compute. Compute, very good. And there we go, and we're really, really close. And I'm going to tell you the reason that we are not any closer than that. If we look at the CFFA, do you think it's actually just dollars? No. In fact, it goes up beyond cents. And so that's why it's not quite the same. Now, while we've got all this in our calculator, I could calculate the IRR. Miss um, Craybill, what button should I hit to get IRR? IRR. Very good, IRR. Now, Ms. Caviani, what button should I hit next? Compute. I'm getting 15.6671861313. Uh, and once again, it comes down to the little bits and pieces that we didn't type in with the calculators. The only reason these are different. Now, when you build a spreadsheet on your own, always test it the first time with your calculator. And after you've verified that everything's working properly, now, if I go back and have to change things, do I have to check it again? No, the machine's working fine unless the co-op student screws it up like I did back in 1991, right? My boss comes by and he's like, what did you do? And it's, I'd screwed up the formulas. How did I do it? I don't know, same way my mom screws up stuff on the computer, right? When you don't know what you're doing, things just happen. Okay, back to the story. Why is it important that we go ahead and build this spreadsheet? You probably, uh, you're looking at this and you're like, you know what, I could have done that by hand in about the same amount of time. And it might be true, but I'm going to tell you at least two reasons why you should go ahead and do the spreadsheet. Number one, your possibility for mistakes is much lower. And number two, what if you have to do this again? Uh, I had a guy, there's a door company here in town, and I forget the name of the door company, but it, one of the students was their manufacturing engineer guy. And he said, yeah, we put in this one door line, and I did one of these analyses. He said, and then the next year when they asked me to do another one, all I had to do was get refreshed quotes and make sure that my inputs were correct, and it just took me like five minutes. And so if you understand how to do things with a spreadsheet versus doing them by hand, you will be a more productive employee. What does that mean for your potential earnings? Who do you think gets paid more, a more productive employee or a less productive employee? Yeah, the more productive employee. This could be the difference between three bedrooms, four bedrooms, between vinyl siding and brick, right? This could, uh, be between Japanese cars and German. There are lots of things we could throw out here, right? Uh, so learn how to use a spreadsheet. It's a power powerful tool, tool, and it can make you a much more valuable employee. And by the way, eventually when you open your own business, do you think it would be better to do it electronically than to, oh, heck yeah, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, questions? Let's see how many spreadsheets I have. I do have a question. Okay. Um, can you go over how you calculated the change in networking capital? Well, yeah. Okay, so remember at year zero, they told us we we're going to start out with 10,000. And then they told us that beyond that, it was going to be a percentage of sales for every year. Well, it turns out that first year sales was just $100,000. So 10% of that $100,000 just turns out to be $10,000. And so that's why the networking capital in year one is $10,000. Well, that's the same as year zero, right? Okay, from then on, we just have 10% of sales every year. And in order to find the change in networking capital, all we do is take this year's networking capital and subtract last year's networking capital. And so that's why in the beginning we have an immediate 10,000, but then the change for year one was zero because it stayed 10,000. But after that it goes up because sales are going up, and so now we start to see positive changes. But what happens when the sales start going down? Well now we require less networking capital, and as a result that change in networking capital is going to start to be negative. Okay. And then we get all the way to the end. The reason we got zero at the end is because we always assume that's the truth because you, you get rid of your inventory, you get rid of everything, and you pay off all your bills, and then you just send the cash back to the mothership, right? 
So that's why we always assume that. And so there's also a big negative cash flow at the end as we basically empty out the checking account and send that money back to the mothership. Right, so for the last year, because I was doing the practice and I was confused on one of the problems, mm -hmm. calculating the last year's net working capital. Okay. So you add, can you repeat what you said about adding back? Calculating the last year's net working capital. Oh, okay. Capital. So the last year's net working capital, we always assume, is zero, right? Okay. And so how do I find the last year's change in net working capital? I look at the prior year's net work, or I take zero minus the prior year's net working capital. Mm -hmm. And that gives me the change in net working capital for the last period. By the way, do you think that the change in net working capital is always positive at the beginning and negative at the end? There's one problem, and it may be on the homework, may be on the exam, may be on the practice. You know, with old age, I forget things. But um, it's about an ordering system. And this new ordering system is supposed to lower inventory. Lower inventory by, say, 30000 bucks. What does that mean the change in networking capital is at the beginning? Does networking capital go up or down? Actually, it goes down. Well, then we assume that it pops back up to zero at the end. And so in that crazy problem, your change in networking capital for time zero is negative, and your change at the end is positive. Why? Because at the end of the project, we're assuming we lose those benefits of having lower inventory, so we're going to have to build our inventory back up. That's the assumption. Does that help you understand? Yes, it does. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's the most common question I get about networking capital, is that one wacky problem about an ordering system and inventory going down. Other questions? Okay, it turns out we still do not have internet, and so I'm going to just talk off the cuff here, but I may have to ask to look at someone's PowerPoints. So, do, do you have your PowerPoints? She does. She does! Why bring them when your neighbor has them? Okay, so here we go. Let's talk about inflation and capital budgeting. So there are two kinds of, war, of, of numbers in this world. Yeah. Oh, so in the slides, there was a slide that said, ball of company example. That's been like the last day and a half, right? Okay. Now we're on to the next slide. Inflation and capital budgeting. Two kinds of numbers in this world, as far as we're concerned. And those are real and nominal. And in fact, if you think back to uh, chapter 5, we discussed something called the Fisher effect. Do you guys remember that? We talked about the difference between real return and nominal return. So let me give you a little refresher here. Real return talks about the increase in your ability to consume. The increase in your ability to consume. Nominal rate just talks about the pure numbers, the pure value of currency, or the pure number of currency units that you're going to receive. And so if I said you could invest 100,000 and you're going to get 110,000 back at the end of the year, your nominal rate would be 10%. Your real rate will depend on inflation. And the relationship looks like this. 1 plus nominal is equal to 1 plus real times 1 plus inflation. And I will use a real life example here. I was in a meeting with uh, the provost on Tuesday, and we were discussing budget stuff, because I am the chair of the Faculty Senate Committee on Budget and Priorities, or something, I forget what it's called, we just call it BMP. Anyway, and so I'm writing a report about the state of pay for faculty at Missouri State, and I had not included anything about the recent COLA, because it was, it happened, COLA, cost of living allowance, it happened past the, the date of all the data for the report, but here's what I want to point out, if we got a, uh, so the raise that we received was 4%, and the inflation rate is 8.2%. What does that mean for our actual ability to consume? 
Well, we can find out. 1.04 is equal to 1 plus little r, which is our real rate, times 1.082, because the CPI for 12 months ending September was 8.2%. So, if I take one point zero four divide by one point zero eight two equals I get this. Now, how do I get R by itself, little R? Yeah, I gotta subtract one. So I'm gonna subtract one, and we can see that our purchasing power has actually dropped by 3.88%. It would have been worse if we hadn't have got the cost of living allowance, but we're still able to buy 4% less pizza now than we were before. Does that make sense? Okay, now we look at the same things in net present value, in, in capital budgeting. And, and there's really a basic simple rule that comes into play here. And that is, if we are using nominal cash flows, in other words, the actual numbers of dollars we're gonna receive in different periods, we use a nominal discount rate. And overall, most of the time, we use a nominal discount rate and nominal cash flows, and here's why. You remember all of those things we're observing out in the market, yield and maturity, required return on the equity, those are all nominal numbers. Anything you observe out in the wild is a nominal number and includes the expectation for inflation. Okay, back to the story. Um, most of the time what we've got is nominal numbers. And so that means when we come up with our cash flows going forward, uh, they need to be nominal numbers too. <coughs> and so what does that mean? It means we need to think about, we need to include, when we're looking at the prices of the balls, we need to include the potential inflation in there also for that. And that's what they did here in the Baldwin Company project. Okay, now let's talk about why uh, real uh, nominal discounted with nominal is the same value as real discounted with real. So we know present value is equal to future value um, divided by 1 plus r to the t. Does that make sense? Okay, actually, let's, let's use big F, big V for nominal, and we'll say like this. Does that make sense so far? I, and I'm just trying to distinguish between the two. So this is nominal, this is nominal. Now, let's throw in here that this is actually the real, and it turns out that inflation acts just like interest as far as compounding. And then, down here, this is 1 plus little r times 1 plus h, all that to the t. Have I lost anybody yet? Okay, now, uh, if I do a little distributing here, this is 1 plus r to the t uh, times 1 plus h to the t. What happens to the 1 plus h to the t's? Cancel out, right? Okay, so what we end up saying here is that nominal numbers do, uh, discounted at the nominal rate is exactly equal to uh, real numbers divided or uh, discounted at the real rate. They're exactly the same. So you're going to get exactly the same MPV. Now, the question is this. If you're doing a project and you've got most of your numbers in uh, nominal and you've got one in real. So let's say you've got 27 numbers in nominal and you've got one in real. Do you convert the 27 nominals to real or do you convert the one real to nominal? Yeah, he converts it to the one nominal and, and, and two reasons. Number one, I am lazy. I've told you that before. I'm lazy, right? And number two, how many mistakes, uh, how many opportunities for mistakes do you have converting one? You got, yeah, not 27, right? You got one opportunity to screw this up. So that's my rule of thumb is if I see a project and it's all real except for one nominal, I'm going to convert that nominal to real. 
Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what you need to know about inflation and capital budgeting. Any questions? Okay, now I'm going to come eyeball the next PowerPoint slide. The role in converting. Oh, I've already done that, yeah. Ooh, now we're going to talk about investment of unequal lives. So, basically, what we're looking at... Oh, here. <laughs> I wonder if I wore some sort of bright, high visibility clothing, if that would help this thing act better. You think this nice yellow? Well, anyway, back to thank you. Back to the story. Investments of unequal lives. It turns out that not all machines have the same lifespan. Sometimes some higher quality machines have longer lifespans than lower quality machines. I'll give you an example. Um, my wife. Uh, I, I killed her 1988 Chevy Cavalier trying to fix it. I, what's that? You had a, my first car. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> great car right up until I killed it. Okay, so uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, not a mechanic, and I proved that, right? I killed a car. So, I had to go out and buy her a new car. And uh, there were uh, two choices I was looking at, the Plymouth Neon and the Honda Civic. Now, if you had to guess, which one of those costs more? Honda Civic. Yeah, the Honda Civic. Uh, but then, uh, but the, what do you, what do you, which one of those do you think is going to last longer? The Honda Civic. And so, the, but there was this tension. Do I buy a car for more? And by the way, we were just starting out. We just bought a house. This is, was the worst possible time for me to kill a car. I, I killed it in the driveway of our brand new house that I hadn't even made the first payment on, right? So I'm in a world of crap. And so I need to buy, I need a car. I'm like, you know, I want, I want, I want the Honda Civic. I already had a Honda Civic of my own that I bought back when I was flush. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we're short of cash. So what do I do? I go ahead and buy the Plymouth Neon. I got 50,000 miles out of that Plymouth Neon before it started leaking every fluid known to man and making odd noises, right? And my Honda Civic, it had 110,000 miles on it when I sold it and it was still in great shape. Now, uh, would those both provide the same service to you on a day-by-day -day basis? Absolutely they would. And so the value of getting your butt from A to B is, is precisely the same in either case. And what we're seeing here, this is about com uh, comparing machines that are going to do exactly the same task, but they have different costs and they have different lives. If they had the same life, we would just choose the cheaper one. But because they have different lives, we have to do a little more analysis. And so the example that we're going to use here is the tennis ball throwing machine. Now I'm going to go ahead and write this number down and bring this back to you. You nutbag. Look at that, it's running away from me. Okay, tie, zero, one. Machine A is uh, $500 up front, and then it's $120 every year. Now, keep in mind, oh, and it's only got a three-year life. Keep in mind that these are all the same sign because they're all costs. Remember we said we're assuming the revenue is the same between these, and so this is just cost. Machine B is uh, $600 up front. Then it has maintenance costs, of, and by the way, these are maintenance costs, or operating costs, whatever you want to think of them as. It lasts four years with these hundreds, and then we have a required return of 10%. Now, let's talk about very quickly what a tennis ball throwing machine is. This is at the country club. What is the country club? What do, what's the purpose of the country club? It's, I'll get you started. It's for rich people to get away from Poor people, right? It's for rich people to get away from poor people. Now, how do we keep poor people out of the country club? We make it expensive, right? 
Now, we got all this money coming in, we got to do something with it, and so country clubs typically, what are the activities that they offer? Golf, Golf tennis. tennis, swimming, and some students say drinking. So those are your big four at the country club. Now, the country club, of course, they got the tennis courts, and you would think that if someone has uh, money that they have friends, but it's not always true. Some of the people at the country club cannot get anyone to play tennis with them because they have no friends. And so this is why the country club invests in the tennis ball throwing machine, right? Because, you know, if no one will play tennis with you, at least you can get the robot because they don't judge, right? Okay, so we're looking at two tennis ball throwing machines here. One costs $500 and it will last three years and costs us 128 a year in maintenance. The other one costs 600 and it costs us 100 a year in maintenance. Now, right now, and it'll last four years. If you were just looking at these right now, which one would you pick? Say again? Probably B. Probably um, B. You know, you're thinking in my Honda Civic example. And I could actually prove to you that there is a discount rate at which A is going to be more uh, a better deal. And the reason is if you've got a really high discount rate, the present value of these future cash flows goes to close to zero, right? And so then it's just the first cash flow that matters. And so that's, we, we can, you know, for example, right now with inflation, maybe we would end up having to choose A. But we're going to see at 10% which one of these is a better deal. Now, how do we go about that? Well, we get out our trusty calculator. CF second, clear work. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take all these cash flows and we're going to use present value to shrimp, scrunch them all into one lump. And then we are going to then use uh, the TVM keys to come up with an annuity that has the same wife as the machine and has the same net present value as the machine. So then we're going to basically blow it out. We're going to have zero here and then three identical cash flows. And those three identical cash flows, the amount is called the equivalent annual cost. And so what I'm going to do is come up with a set of cash flows that is zero XXX that has exactly the same uh, life and um, present value as this beginning. So the first step here is to find the present value of these things. And so we're going to use our CF keys. And the first one is 500. And remember, the sign is the same on all of these because they are all expenses. You might say, well, wait a minute, shouldn't they all be negative? Hey, knock yourself out, have a good time. I'm lazy, right? And I know I make mistakes. So I'm just going to say positive. C01, what's C01? 120. Enter arrow down. What's F01? Three. Enter. Now, uh, what button should I hit to find the present value of all those cash flows? Ms. Wabi. NPV, very good. And we said the required rate of return is 10%. Enter. Arrow down, compute. And so it is $798.42. And so that is the NPV here. 798.42, is that right? Mm -hmm. Now, the next step, I want to do something right now. I want to say store one, just in case everything goes horribly wrong. And I'm going to uh, hit uh, clear, clear. That gets rid of everything except for uh, the number. And I'm going to hit second future value. What does that do? Clears out the time value of money, right? And so I'm going to put this in as my present value. And what should I put in for N? How long's the life of the machine? Three. Three, very good. Three, N. And what should I put in for I per Y? Ten. Ten, very good. And then what am I going to compute? Payment, yeah, it's a, it's a repeating cash flow. And so we can see that this, this is the EAC, the equivalent annual cash flow is what, $321.06. So if this were a zero, 321.06, 321.06, 321.06, the present values would be exactly the same, exactly. Yes. Did you put 1,000 for a future value, or did you put? No, no, no. This isn't a bond, man. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
every time he sees payments, he's thinking, woohoo, coupons! Yeah, you'd be waiting forever. I think it's the same, the 798 for both the present value and future value. So it was the future value here, so you can get absolute right. So this NPV is a present value. It's when I took all of this and crunched it back to time zero. And then this series is where I have now expanded it back out to come up with three equal payments that have the same present value. No, no, no. And one of the reasons I hit second clear TVM is if there was a future value just lurking out there. I think that's where I got confused because I saw you hit future value and I didn't know. Oh, because I hit the second button first. Yeah. Yeah. See, when you look away just momentarily. <laughs> Okay, now that's one. Let's go ahead and do the second one. S uh, CF second, clear work. What's CF zero for the second one? 600. 600. Enter, arrow down. What's C zero one? 100. Enter, what's F zero one? Four. Enter, what button do I hit next, Mr. Fisher? Very good. And what do I put in for that, uh, Mr. Umfleet, for I? Uh, 10. Yep. Enter. And then, uh, Mr. This is Scott. Mr. Scott, what do I do next? Arrow down. Arrow down, and then what do I compute? I mean, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> I compute, right? Okay, so, NPV. 969, oh no, 91969. 91968. 91968. 916. 98. 98. Whew, good, thank you. 916, 98. It's close enough. Oh my goodness. You should be an auditor. Okay, back to the story. Uh, okay, so how am I going to figure the equivalent annual cost? Well, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to store one just in case thing, everything goes horribly wrong. And then I'm going to say second, clear TVM. And then I'm going to say PV. What should I put in for N this time? Four, very good. And what should I put in for I per Y? Ten. Ten. And then what should I compute? Yeah, compute payment. I'm getting. Uh, $289.28. Okay, now, if you had a choice between paying this much per year and paying this much per year, which would you choose? The lower one. We always choose the lower one. We always choose the lower one. It's always funny, students have trouble with this until I say, if it were your money, what would you do? And they're like, phew, i go for the lower one, right? And so that's what we do. Now, if, once again, if they had been um, the uh, same number of periods, all we would have had to have done would be to compare the NPVs and choose the lower NPV. But because they are not equal lives, we have to go ahead and do the second step. Okay, now uh, the next one. Let's see. Get them up here. Oh yeah. Okay, so we're going to talk about that text slide, and then I'll actually do the example next time, and I'll push the homework out. So, just in case, I'll look. If this is covered on the homework, then I will push it out. Oh, just <laughs> Okay. So, a lot of times, what we have is, uh, in fact, um, when I worked with the, the equipment that, you know, that was in my first group that I was totally responsible for, profit and loss and everything else, firing people and such, um, every machine there had been made, been made 1979 or before. And so it turns out that something happens to machines and people as they age. What do you think happens to maintenance costs as people get older? <laughs> They go up. You guys are so young, you probably don't even take vitamins, right? But then you get to be a little older, and your doctor says, you should probably think about taking vitamins. And you're like, mm, okay. And then your doctor says, 
you're getting a little fat. And you say, because, you know, that's the way my doctor talks to me. And I said, well, yeah. And he says, well, let's talk about that. And he says, what's going on? I said, well, I eat the same things I've always eaten. He's like, yeah, but as you get older, your body requires more exercise to maintain the same size. And so the older I get, the more and more I have to exercise in order to stay the same weight. I figure by the time I retire, I will be able to run a marathon on a stalk of broccoli because I'm just getting really, really efficient, right? Okay, so my point to you is, as the body gets older, uh, more and more maintenance is required. The same thing is true with machines. When you first buy a machine, uh, let's, let's talk about cars. Most of you know about cars. Uh, what's gonna require more maintenance, a new car or an old car? Even, even if you don't think of the warranty cost, typically the old car is going to require more maintenance because things get older, things uh, wear out, things have to be replaced. For example, your belts and hoses on the car, did you know they don't last forever? They last like five years. I have two five-year-old cars in my garage. Guess what I need to do over the break, right? I need to get new belts and new hoses. Um, did I need to do that when the cars were three years old? Absolutely not. I had a, a Nissan Sentra, and in the beginning, I gave her gasoline and oil changes, and she gave me nothing but love. But then, she started going, <coughs> right? <coughs> hey, need a little help. <coughs> and so I took her to the Nissan dealership, and they said, oh, well, it needs this, and it was like 300 bucks. I'm like, okay. And then one morning, and this is a couple years later, one morning, I get up to go to work. I stick my key in the ignition. I turn the key. All the bells, whistles, lights come on, but not a damn thing happens. And it turns out that the starter was just dead. And I figured that out on my own, that it was the starter. It's nothing else. The battery is fine. The solenoid, all this stuff's fine. That starter itself had died. Now, I get to looking at it, and it's like buried way down under there. And then I look at it from underneath, and it's like way up there. And I'm like, poof, I'm taking this to the dealership. We're going to get that changed out with someone else. Because my car's dead, I have to have it towed. And that was like 35 bucks back then. You know what it is today? Yeah, it's closer to 100 right? And then, well, maybe I paid 50 but uh, then it cost $600 to get the starter replaced. Well, then a little further on down the road, everywhere that I would go, she's kind of like on the road, and then she makes this horrible noise when I go over speed bumps. Good chunk, good chunk, good chunk. And it turns out all the bushings had worn out on the suspension and some other stuff too. Thousand bucks. And so the older the car gets, the more the maintenance builds up. Now, how does this come into finance? What at some point, what we need to do is say, look, it's cheaper to pony up and buy a new machine and start getting those lower maintenance costs than it is to continue to pour money into this old machine. Does that make sense? And so what the general decision to replace is all about is finding that balance. When is it good to replace the old machine? And I'll give you a hint how we're going to do that. We're going to look at the new machine we're going to figure out an equivalent annual cost for the new machine, just exactly like we did right here. And then what we're going to do is look at every year in the life of that old machine and the first time that it becomes um, that the EAC is lower than that maintenance cost that's going to be on that machine going forward, then we can pull the trigger and get the new machine. Now it's a little more complex than that, but that's the basics of it. So that's what we're going to talk about next time. But I will go ahead and tell you about where the numbers come from since we have three minutes. Um, so the numbers for the new machine, where do I get them from? Well, I can get the price from the new machine dealer. They might also be able to give me an estimate on what that maintenance is going to be going forward. So the new machine may be straightforward. Uh, the old machine, to get the maintenance numbers, there are two possible sources. Most good organizations will have a maintenance department. And most good maintenance departments keep records. And so you could look at perhaps the historical trend and come up with, I can tell another machine that needs to be replaced right here. <laughs> you can look at that historical trend and try to predict what it's going to be going forward. But I'll tell you this, there are things that get thrown in there uh, like uh, I had a machine and it was doing this every year on the maintenance and I was talking to my maintenance guy about what next year was going to be and he says, well, he says, it's going to be that plus 30,000 bucks. 
I said, 30,000 bucks. And he said, yeah, because next year we have to change out the thrust bearing. They're only good for like 50,000 hours, and yours has 48,000 or whatever on it. I forget the exact numbers. But the idea is that there are these occasionally these big things you have to do. Uh, example, airliners, they have to be stripped down to the metal every like six years and inspected and then basically rebuilt. Huge cost. And so if you were in the airline business and you were year five and you're thinking, oh, well, year six is just going to be a little, little bigger than five, you'd be wrong, right? So who do you talk to? You talk to your maintenance people. Now, here's the problem with maintenance people. Do maintenance people prefer old machines or new machines? Old, why? Okay. Yeah, how? Yeah, the old machine has more things to repair. I'm telling you, when I worked at the nuclear plant, by the way, the operators and the mechanics got paid by the hour, engineers got paid salary. All the incidents that required repair happened at Friday, 4.30 p.m. What do you think that was? Yeah, they're gonna get 150% of their hours, uh, of, their, of their hourly rate. Now, I'm an engineer. I'm on a salary. What am I going to get? Somewhere between jack and squat, right? And then, so here's the, and by the way, nuclear plants are ran by old Navy guys because the Navy's big into nuclear power. Okay, so ours was an ex-submarine commander named Buzz Carnes. And whenever one of these things would hit, Buzz would say, all hands on deck which is like a Navy thing, right? All hands on deck, which means everybody's there, needs to jump on this problem and solve it. But they told us then that we could start flexing our hours. What do you think the engineers started doing on Friday? Seven to four, baby, right? And that way we were not on deck. We weren't, any, we weren't on the all hands call when it went out. So maintenance people will lie to you. They will try to tell you that the maintenance costs are gonna be lower in order to hold on to that older machine for longer. And there's one other reason that they prefer old machines. I had a guy that he was the only one in the world that we knew of that could fix machine 237. As soon as I replied, and by the way, do you think we could fire him? No, man, he could, he could smoke weed and throw the smaller workers in the trash can. There wasn't anything we could do to get rid of him. But as soon as I replaced that machine, guess what? Boop, he's gone. Questions? Okay, we'll finish that up next time.